if I go to the supermarket and I find an old guy and he's all hunched over his cart, I know you've seen this before, he's hunched over his cart and he's got his head lifted to look up and out, that is not a function of biology. That is a function of nurture. That is a function of culture. You can unwind that. And you can unwind that because people, he didn't, he didn't just wake up that way one day. Right. He evolved to that point over the course of his lifetime. And that's what I'm trying to prevent. Welcome to the Wellness Plus Podcast. I'm your host, Karina Rachel, and I'm joined today by Robert Gardner, massage therapist and yoga instructor. Robert, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me on again. It's always a pleasure. So I was hoping that you could maybe shed a little light on the topic of low back pain. Is this something that you see a lot of people coming into your massage practice for? I see it uh, very regularly because I have a practice that focuses on chronic pain and pain reduction, pain management. Um, I see it less often than upper back and neck pain, but it is very common. Mm -hmm. I would say 20 to 30% of the people I come, you know, they come into my office are having problems with that. And in addition, just generally, it's mildly just an epidemic. Um, mm -hmm. Upper back and low back pain are the two main things that most massage therapists have to deal with on a daily basis. And I mean, do you feel that upper and lower back pain are related or are these kind of two pretty separate issues in terms of how you approach them? Um, I mean, it's, you know, soft tissue manipulation. It's not that dissimilar. Um, it's slightly different because of body positioning and structure. When people are having low back pain, uh, it's hard for them to get up and get around and get things done. Upper back pain is more just frustrating because you know they can get up and move around but they just still hurt all the time so that'd be like you have a crick in your neck or just really tense tight shoulders you can you can avoid using your neck or turning your neck as much you right. can't really avoid i have to get out of bed yeah you have to stand up which involves your low back right and you know as you pointed out you know low back when that starts to flare up it's one of those things where it hurts to stand, and it hurts to sit, and it hurts to lay. It's just kind of this um, unresolvable problem, or at least that's how I typically end up feeling when my low back is kind of screaming at me. Um, it feels like there's really nothing that I can do to help it, um, but I'm hoping you can maybe shed some wisdom on the topic uh, of what can people do for low back pain. A lot of low back pain, it's interesting to me as an educator, my practice, because I blended elements of massage and yoga, primarily time massage and yoga, I look at both low back pain very differently than other massage therapists. What that means to me is I'm going to wind up working with you completely clothed on a mat where I'm going to, nine times out of ten, if you're having low back pain, I'm going to work on your hips and I'm going to work on your low back and I'm going to work on your gluteals. Because that insertion of the legs into the hips, into the low back, is usually what's influencing structure and posture in the lumbar spine, which is then making that cascade that leads into low back pain. Mm -hmm. Nine times out of ten, I can show people things within ten minutes of working on themselves in a yoga class that can drastically reduce their low back pain that they can't really believe is possible. Mm -hmm. they, they're they like, are you kidding me? Like many massage therapists will put somebody prone, meaning face down on a table. They'll take the elbow and stick it into their lumbar paraspinals. Nine times out of 10, that's not where the pain is coming from. The pain is coming from the hips, the pelvis, the psoas, the lumbar spine. It's not coming from the lumbar paraspinals in my experience in many instances. So if we could talk about the common culprits of low back pain, you're actually generally looking at the lower part of the body. Yes. Interesting. So from a, a DIY or self-care at home perspective, what does that mean for people to actually 
For me, you lay down on your back, you bring your knees into a, like a sit-up position, and you start doing what I call the windshield wiper, which is just moving your low legs from one side to the other, back and forth slowly. Mm -hmm. Nine times out of ten, when they go over to one side, I'll say the right, I mean, um, excuse me, they're having problems on the right side, I'll just make a guess, the right-handed, right leg, right dominant. They'll move their legs over to the left and go, hey, that kind of feels good in my back and I go cool so now extend your leg or legs you know kind of do a twist and lengthen what your gluteals your hamstrings your IT band you're lengthening all that stuff through the hips mm -hmm. which leads into your low back a lot of times it feels like the rotatories the muscles that control vertebra to, to vertebra turning and twisting have gotten really really tight mm. So what you're doing is you're actually lengthening and stretching one of those muscles on one side of the spine by going into that twist, but you're also accessing what? You're accessing the, the legs, the hips, and sort of the structural foundation of the lumbar spine. Mm -hmm. That means that your lumbar spine in those rotatories and those small muscles isn't going eh, because it's trying to balance you out, but it can't fight with your gluteal muscles. They're huge. It can't fight with your quads, can't fight with your hamstrings. They're huge muscle groups. Mm -hmm. Nine times out of 10, I'm, I'm essentially addressing the foundation beneath where they're having pain, to make a long story short. Mm -hmm. If people want to work on that, we talked about, or we talked about this previously, a tennis ball and gluteals. Nine times out of 10, people cannot believe that so much of their back pain goes away from working on their gluteals. They're like, that's not my back. And it's like, well, your low back is basically foundationally at your sacrum and your gluteals wrap around, you know, both sides of the sacrum. So to me, saying low back and gluteals is just about saying the same thing. Interesting. Interesting. And you've shown that technique of using a tennis ball um, to work into those kind of like deep muscles of the glutes um, and you're right that's a wonderful thing that we can do for ourselves because if we are just um, kind of sitting or laying back on a tennis ball we can really you know number one start noticing what feels tense and tight in our bodies uh, but then also really uh, carefully control how much pressure do we put in that area you know, because you're just putting your weight down onto the tennis ball, um, you know, in that area of pain or tension or whatever. So by that rationale, um, stretching the hamstrings, uh, working on hip mobility, um, working on uh, reducing tight muscles in the hips and glutes would be like a good recommendation for somebody with mm -hmm. low back. Yeah, most of the low back pain I see 80% plus uh, when people are not having, you know, surgical issues or not having, you know, lumbar issues, disc issues. I mean, when they're not having that, they're having some sort of muscle tightness. They're having some si sort of slight imbalance that's causing some issue. If I can help them find out what muscles are tight and help them lengthen, stretch, massage those muscles, nine times out of 10, they, they walk out of my office and just can't believe that it's mm. even possible yeah. that they could feel that way. Um, the way it feels to me as I describe it is it's almost like your, your sacrum, um, which is just above your tailbone. It's like five or six fused vertebra below your lumbar spine. The sacrum feels like it floats in place. Hmm. Interesting. So, you know, one of the things that's uh, been gaining a lot of media attention lately is just uh, the idea of sitting and that our bodies really weren't built to sit. I've heard people say that sitting is the new smoking. Uh, what's your perspective on, you know, sitting as a potential cause of low back pain? I don't necessarily think that uh, sitting itself is bad, just as you know, any posture uh, position that you hold is bad. So for instance, if I'm, I'll give you an example, if I'm in a kitchen and I'm looking down at the counter and I'm using a cutting board and a knife, it's not really bad, it's just moving your body around. Now the problem is if I'm a chef and I'm doing that for eight hours a night, mm then it starts to become repetitive. It starts to become a problem. How often do I spend my time opening my chest and doing back bends? Mm. Well, I certainly don't at work. The <laughs> other portion is, it, to me, it's about balance. Um, I think, did you mention squatting at some point? 
Uh, we had talked about that previously. Okay, I wasn't sure if you had or not. So I, I don't think sitting in and of itself is bad. I think sitting in the same position without moving for prolonged periods of time is bad. Mm -hmm. So recently I've seen more people using standing desks, things like that. You know, for me, it's about movement. When you think about the environments that we involved in, they did not include furniture. Mm -hmm. They include getting up and walking huge distances because before transportation vehicles, you know, we had to walk everywhere we went or run. So it's just about movement. It's not that I think sitting in and of itself is that bad. I think that the ischial tuberosities are essentially designed for us to be able to sit. Now, in addition, when you talk about sitting, I do think that squatting or the lack of squatting is an issue. I don't know how much actual research has been done on that. Yeah. Well, I know that there's definitely, you know, a lot of recommendations that are coming down um, about uh, spending more time in that squat type position or malasana like yoga squat. Um, and I know for me that when I move into that position, it feels really, really good. Mm -hmm. um, I become immediately aware of lots of tension on the inside of my legs. Um, but then also just in terms of the spine, it does feel like a really neutral position for the spine. However, I think for a lot of people's bodies, squatting and even coming, you know, all the way down into that full like malasana yoga squat where you're like really squatting down all the way, it's not really accessible for everyone. And certainly if you've got really tight legs, tight inner thighs, tight glutes and hips, I mean, even a, a mild version of a squat mm -hmm. can be really challenging. What you just described to me is American average, and it's not that I go out and teach people to squat in any sort of conscious way. What I do is, one, I was in gymnastics in high school, so there was more a little more movement when I was 15, starting from there. Then um, I got into yoga and then Thai massage. I work on a mat, not a table. My hip mobility is completely off the charts because most people's men, especially in the West, uh, hip mobility is extremely limited. Mm. I squat, kneel, stand constantly all day long when I work. Mm -hmm. um, I'm mobilizing my hips while I work. Right. So for me, it's not a big deal when I teach massage therapists. First day of class, they do okay. Second day of class, they come in. I'm like, hey, is anybody sore? And they're like, oh, <laughs> my low back and my hips. And yeah, because they're not used to holding those positions. Mm -hmm. It's something that people in the East do constantly. You can go to India and find an 80 year old man who's sitting down, you know, on the ground, ask him to stand up and without using his hands, he just balances himself and presses himself up. He's 80. You don't ask 80 year olds in the West to do that. They're in wheelchairs. They can't even walk hardly. Um, that's the position that we're in. The actual remedy for that is unknown to me. I get into a, 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 I have a fear, I guess, of ostracizing people to be able to talk about, you know, what's the benefit of working on a mat. I think that in my work specifically, I'm sort of solving that problem for massage therapists without going into extreme discussion about differences between East and West, mm -hmm. villainizing one culture and lifting the other up on high as having the answers. Um, I tend to be very balanced that way. I think it's about movement. Mm -hmm. You know, why are people not comfortable? I mean, at all sitting on the floor. Yeah. Cause we have, well, we have furniture that's, you know, you know, but the thing is, it's like, it's just a function of like our culture and how things are done. Mm -hmm. Most people are in a position where they sit in a chair, they sit in their car, they sit up on the bed. You know, we don't have a bed on the floor. Think about how odd even just the idea sounds. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, that's how we evolved. We didn't evolve having, you know, furniture and chairs. So, And I think it's interesting, you know, so you touched on a couple of really important things. One, which is just uh, our recurring habits, our recurring postures. Um, and I think it's really interesting to hear you say that, well, it's not sitting itself that's so bad. It's just sitting for really prolonged periods of time, sitting um, as our 
primary position that we spend most of our time in compared to squatting or standing mm-hmm. or, you know, doing more of these like hip opening types of stretches or yoga poses, for instance. Movement. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, as a massage therapist, when I talk about it, um, it's easier for me to talk about it from my perspective in my industry. I'm in an industry full of boxers. I'm essentially teaching them Brazilian jiu-jitsu. They're not used to using their legs to work on people, to strike people, so to speak. Like I'm massaging people, quote unquote, with my feet, Mm -hmm. my knees. It's a very different skill set. It's a very different practice. What I'm doing is taking these Western therapists and opening up the low back and opening up their hips and increasing mobility and then helping them with those things. Once they become acclimated to it, they don't want to give it up. (laughs) They wonder, how did I ever, you know, and it's like, yeah, because you were putting too much pressure on one area of your body, normally their hands and arms, and then decreasing the pressure on their legs. But can you, can you punch harder than you can kick? No, it's, it's physically impossible. Legs are a bigger, broader structure. They deliver more force when used correctly. Mm-hmm. So when it comes to mobility, it's just movement. Right. You know, it's like if you get in a pool and swim, well, you can move around. Mm-hmm. Like you can move your legs in ways you can't on land, right. which is just accessing movement in ways that you don't normally, you know, sitting in an office chair. I don't think that sitting in and of itself is bad. Then we get in discussions about, well, how do you sit? Then it's getting towards meditation mm-hmm. to me. That's what the discussion is. And when people have their knees level with their hips, they slouch. Mm. If you drop your knees below your hips, you sit upright more naturally and easily. The whole goal in in yoga is essentially to get you into lotus, which is basically to try to get your hips slightly higher than your knees Mm -hmm. so that you can sit comfortably for a prolonged period of time. Mm -hmm. It's not because sitting has the most virtue. It's because sitting is upright, you're awake, and you can sit comfortably relaxed for a long period of time. That was essentially the goal of yoga to begin with. And it's interesting that you mentioned that about keeping the hips above the knees um, because a lot of times when we film yoga videos, um, the instructor will recommend that you sit up on a bolster or a pillow to lift your hip bones up above your knees. And I know for me, I just feel more comfortable when I Mm -hmm. do that. Uh, But now you just explained why. (laughs) Well, it's because it's actually easier for you to sit up straight when you don't have your knees, you know, hiked up. And even as I sit on this chair, I can notice that, you know, when my legs are just sitting there flat, knees level with my hips, it's not as easy to sit up straight as if I kind of pull to the end of the chair Mm -hmm. where my knees can sink a little lower. And now I'm like sitting up straight almost. When we we talk about a standing desk, when we talk about furniture and design, you literally get to a point where people start using the word primal for everything. And they start saying that, you know, the way we're using our bodies and the more correct way to use your body, nine times out of 10, I just think it involves mobility. It's not absolutely right or wrong. There's nothing wrong with classic furniture. But whatever position I'm in, if I spend eight hours a day there, it's going to have an impact. Mm -hmm. It can't not have an impact. Right. Yeah. Right. So, you know, taking that uh, example of the standing desk, um, so we actually showed a a standing desk on the channel a while back, um, and I had a lot of people kind of write to me and be like, man, I get really exhausted standing up all day. (laughs) And I was like, oh man, I got to clarify this. Well, the idea is not for you to stand up the whole day instead of sitting. It's just about being able to break up the periods that you're sitting with 10 minutes of standing or 20 minutes of standing Mm -hmm. throughout the day. Um, And the cool thing about those, you know, desk risers that let you have it low, lift it up, put it at a different level, um, is just like you're saying, keeping you moving throughout the day, um, allowing you to not spend, you know, five hours straight in one single position, um, just encouraging you to kind of like mix it up, put your body into a different uh, position. Um, I generally recommend people, you know, if you can just get up from your desk uh, once a day, you know, walk around the office, walk around the building, um, do some squats, you know, the just like little Malasana yogi squat is something that I 
find myself doing all the time because um, it just feels so good. Um, and largely, I think that if people are just kind of open to this idea of move your body, um, work on your mobility, which just means being in different positions than you normally are, um, and letting your body move in all the ways that it's supposed to move. You know, we can look at the body when we're seated and notice that, well, clearly there's a lot of uh, other ways that we're meant to be. We're meant to stand, we're meant to walk. As you pointed out earlier, we can even like back bend and stuff like that. Now, clearly I think back bends are probably, you know, a little too difficult for the average person. There's a lot involved. And um, when I say back bend, if I'm slouching forward and I sit up straight, that's back bending to me. I want to clarify yeah. that. I'm a yoga teacher. So when I say back bend, I don't mean full wheel, which is like hands and feet on the floor doing a full back bend. But anyway, go ahead. Yeah. And I, yeah, I think that, you know, even even that is such a, a key thing to realize is that even if we're just talking about like you sit in your chair and you kind of like bend your arms back and just slightly bend your back, you know, backward rather than forward, you're getting those, those back bend benefits, so to speak, and just helping to um, remind the spine that it has all these different ways it can move um, and just getting out of those constant repetitions of the same movement over and over. So when it comes to low back pain, we talked about um, the glutes, the hamstrings. Uh, what other muscles do you typically find are maybe involved or associated with back pain when you're working on people? People, people are having problems with their psoas, and the psoas is a muscle that's a little hard to visualize because you can't grab it the same way you can your bicep. But the psoas are core stability muscles that connect along your lumbar spine in the front. So if I scooped out your internal organs... <laughs> and they go down from your lumbar spine to your hips on either side. A lot of people will have problems with both sides, and they have just a generalized kind of phantom pain out along their sacrum. Mm. They'll have tightness there because the muscle is shortened. When you sit in a chair all day, you've essentially put the muscle in a position where it's shortened. Back bending tends to lengthen the muscle. So how much how much time do we spend with our knee going like backwards into a back bend in our lumbar spine? Very small. Exactly. So when you sit in a desk for prolonged periods of time, that muscle is in a shortened position. A lot of people, it just gets stuck there. Um, stuck there. It becomes shortened chronically. They just have like a general low back pain. And I think that's where a lot of sitting problems actually come in. It's not because, excuse me, sitting itself is that problematic. It's because they've been in that one position too long mm -hmm. and they need to come see me, take a yoga class, go swimming, do something that's more mobile for the area. Mm -hmm. But the so is, is on both sides. Um, I've heard massage therapists say this and I'm not exactly sure. I'd have to do comparative anatomy from uh, cattle to humans, but they say that uh, the so is is filet mignon. That's the cut of the cow that is used. But we use ours in a different way because we walk upright. So Interesting. So just anatomically, the filet mignon is in the same area of the body as yeah, I, I haven't, so as on a human. I haven't done comparative anatomy, but I've been told that before that it's essentially the same muscle. It's just, you know, on a quadruped or a biped like mm -hmm. ourselves. So it's used in a slightly different way on humans. Interesting. So um, what's a good way of, of stretching the psoas? So what I have people do just for something simple, most people have a bed so they can lay on the bed and put their leg off to one side mm. so that the leg can gently drape over the side of the bed and start to lengthen. They can then kind of twist their body to be able to access, they'll feel it in their lumbar spine. Um, they'll feel like a stretch in the front, usually feel a little sensation in the lumbar spine, maybe around the hip. Mm -hmm. That's lengthening the psoas. Again, you can look it up. Um, online, just find up a picture of the psoas. It's origin, meaning when it starts, and it's insertion, meaning where it ends, just like a rope piece of tissue. Mm -hmm. um, you're just lengthening it from the beginning to the end. Um, I think that's probably the easiest way to do so. In various yoga poses, they do it in upward bow. They do it in uh, halasana. Sorry, that's plow pose. Um, they do it in... Um, 
with the upward bow. They do it in the wheel. They also do it in, is it standing bow pulling pose? That's it. You're lengthening soas uh, in that instance. I mean, in addition to some other muscles. Mm -hmm. But those are the common yoga ones that I can think of. There's also debates about whether people are having, you know, a weak soas that they need to strengthen or a tight soas that they need to stretch. I think it's a little bit in between. Some people can have like a really tight soas that's compensating for other muscles that are weak. And that's where you have to have a good body worker like me to be able to help you unwind tight muscles and then a good personal trainer or yoga teacher to help you strengthen the muscles that were weak. Interesting. So what's another uh, maybe like muscular culprit of low back pain? Um, other people, there's some complexity. Now, uh, some people in their pelvic bowl will have problems. The pelvic bowl is a little bit more challenging as a massage therapist because I can't manually put my hands on it. Um, other people will have issues with their abs, rectus abdominis. They're having problems with the multifity. They're having problems with quadratus lumborum. Again, if any of those terms confuse you, just look those up. Uh, just muscles. Uh, the QL is quadratus lumborum. It's Latin. You have one on either side. It's a hip hiker. So when I stand on my left leg and hike my right hip, I'm shortening quadratus lumborum. It attaches at the top of what we think of as the hips or the, the ilia, which is your you know, iliac crest in the lumbar spine. And it, it connects at your lower ribs. So it just shortens that space so you can hike your hips. Some people have chronic tensions in an area like that. Some of the same stretches for psoas tend to lengthen that as well. But it really depends on the specific muscles that are causing people problems. So sometimes they'll have general tension in their gluteals, they'll have general tension in their hips, they have general tension in the QL or the psoas. The pain is right in their lumbar spine. And the reason they're having pain, it seems to me from a musculoskeletal standpoint, the reason they're having pain right there in that piece of the lumbar spine is because of one muscle on one side of the spine called a rotatory. And that one muscle on one side is lost the battle and it's going and it is a little bit, a little bitty guy like my pinky is a little bitty. It cannot fight with your gluteals. Mm. Your gluteals won the battle and turned your sacrum one direction. That muscle's trying to compensate. When I come in and soften all your gluteals, soften all your hips, mobilize your sacrum. And that guy goes, oh, thank, oh, thank you so much, Mr. Gardner for <laughs> Putting, putting us back basically into what feels like a little more balanced so that muscle isn't so tight. That's what I was describing when I said that the sacrum feels like it floats in place. Mm. That's where being a mechanic as a body worker comes in. Mm. Sometimes where they feel pain, it isn't just from there. It's coming from somewhere else. I don't want to overly complicate the issue, but let's say you had completely fallen arches. The completely fallen arches of your feet affect where your ankles are, affect where your knees are, affect where your hips are, and affect your low back. Mm. Yeah. And I think I think it's you that you know had mentioned in a previous podcast that the, you know the body's like a pulley system, so everything is connected, everything relies on you know other muscle groups, other parts of the body. Oftentimes, we'll see this kind of. Um, diagonal relationship where like there will be tension in the right shoulder and tension in the left hip and it just kind of all um, you know it just kind of comes together and when you you know do look at a picture of anatomy and physiology um, you can kind of get a sense of how all the muscles literally um, they intertwine they loop together they um, sometimes connect in ways that we don't you know maybe don't make sense in our mind um, but then when you're actually looking at the physiology and then comparing that with what you're feeling you can start to get a sense of oh yeah you know okay so I'm right dominant I do everything with my right side well now I'm having this issue on the left because it's trying to compensate mm -hmm. for my right side being stronger and you can kind of get that uh, you know kind of complexity that's going on within the body and how um, doing something like yoga and stretching and, you know, trying to care for the entire spine and the entire body is going to have this, you know, somewhat domino effect mm -hmm. 
um, to actually resolve the specific pain that you're feeling. When I talk to people about yoga, they'll ask me occasionally for a definition and I'll say it's moving and breathing with awareness. They get frustrated at that answer, but that's what I think it is. It's about movement, and what I notice is use it or lose it applies. If you don't maintain your mobility, you will lose it as you age. Mm -hmm. I've worked in enough nursing homes to see what happens when people stop using their mobility. We've all seen... Um, you know, Facebook videos of, you know, some woman who's 75 years old who lifts weights. She does not look 75 years old. She looks like she's 50. And it's because she's maintained her mobility. She's maintained her strength. She's lifting weights, using her body in various ways. Part of it is nature, but I think the large portion that I see, and it's why I do what I do for a living, is nurture. Yeah. So we've made a lot of, of back pain stretching videos and yoga for back pain. And one of the most common stretches that people will show is that uh, figure four stretch where you kind of lay on your back and then um, kind of make a, make a four, so to speak, with your legs. So like one leg is bent. Um, can you talk a little bit about that stretch and why it's so effective for low back pain? Nine times out of ten, I will just ask people because when they come in to see me, they don't have MRIs or CAT scans. I'm a massage therapist, not a doctor. I will ask them, you have low back pain. Does it seem to hurt more when you back bend or forward bend? And they'll say, oh, um, back bending seems to make it like it kind of aggravates it. Mm -hmm. I'm like, so you like to forward bend? And they'll say, yeah, generally when I bend forward at the waist, it feels nice. What they're doing is not just lengthening the hamstrings from that figure four stretch. What they're doing is the hamstrings insert on the ischial tuberosities, which essentially are connecting to the sacrum, the low back and the hips, which are flattening the lumbar spine, which are creating a little bit of space in an area that's not getting any movement. Mm -hmm. And then in addition, the bent leg, where they feel it in their gluteals, they're stretching those muscles around the sacrum. They're, mm -hmm. they're doing this big full stretch on all those different areas, depending on the nuance that they've given it in the particular pose. But the figure four is one that I'll teach people regularly. Mm -hmm. And it's just a way that they're mobilizing tissue that I think is chronically shortened. Mm. Um, are there other yoga stretches that you maybe want to talk about here? And so I, I think that the figure four is good. Um, I'll do modifications of the figure four where I'll have somebody, they're on their back, but instead of having their feet down the ground, they put their feet on a wall. So it allows them to get more bend at the sacrum, more flattening of the lumbar spine temporarily to be able to put their foot on a wall in that figure four. They can also grab that bent knee and pull it over across to their chest where they can stretch down through piriformis in their gluteals. They're getting all the deep lateral rotators. I don't have to go into great detail about those. You can look them up again. Mm -hmm. But just complex muscles around the hips and gluteals. When I take a yoga student, and when I say yoga student, I mean someone who just came in off the street. They don't need to know all those muscles. I go, hey, move your leg this way. How does that feel? And they go, ooh, hey, what's that? And then I go, oh, yeah, no, nah, you're probably having a problem with piriformis. We just diagnosed, if you will, muscle tension in a certain area. It just, I'm looking at the muscles. I'm just looking at general movement because they can understand that. And we give them a little bit more information to work on themselves. The other one is if they're on their back and they put both feet on the wall and then they lift their lumbar spine, kind of curling the tailbone under, mm -hmm. you know, to be able to get some movement of the sacrum. Most people seem to be in a locked position, like when you talked about um, standing and standing causing problems. I think it's because of how people are standing. And I know it seems like such a, a you know, minutia, like, what are you talking about? It's like, it's, it's a Yengar yoga. It is aligning people in space. I had a friend who was having problems playing violin. His name is Josh. Um, I said, Josh, come over here, play your violin. Let me watch. 
And he immediately goes into this posture and he's playing his violin. And I go, okay, listen, hold on. Let me align you from your feet up. And what I did is I took his lower body and I aligned him according to what I understand of proper alignment in a Yangar yoga, especially in his lumbar spine mm -hmm. and up through his, his lower half of his body. Once I got him into position, I'm like, play, play now. And he was go flummoxed. He could not believe how much different it felt and how much better it was because he was adopting a sort of weird spine posture because he's focusing on playing his violin. When I brought his awareness to his, the rest of his body, that misalignment, at least because he's playing for prolonged periods of time, you know, that discrepancy went away. I literally will look at musicians. I, I love music. When I watch musicians play sometimes, I want to go and like do body work and yoga with them because, are you ready for this? Um, I can help free up their nervous system so that they're more mentally clear so they can focus on playing. That sounds awesome. <laughs> I, I mean, and you'd think, no, that's not, no, yes, it is. It is absolutely the case. It's like, if you're an accountant who sits in a chair, we talked about the problem of counting, right? When you get rid of low back pain, when you get rid of muscular tension, you're still you, but you're a clear you that does your accounting and plays your solo better. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So a lot of people are just having muscular tension and a lot of people, uh, a key culprit I see with low back pain is piriformis. People are having tightness in their gluteals. We always think of gluteus maximus. That's the one most people know, uh, mm -hmm. uh, thanks to, um, what's his name? Oh, I forgot his name all of a sudden. Uh, Sir mix -a -Lot. Yeah, he was the one who helped us know about uh, gluteus maximus. Um, but piriformis is a muscle deeper down. It actually inserts on the inside of the sacrum. So in the front, but it attaches on the outside of the hip at the greater trochanter. Um, it's that bony knob you feel on the side, just outside of your uh, tuchus there. Mm -hmm. There's a little bony knob on your femur. That's your greater trochanter. That's where piriformis attaches. It's dead center in the keister. Um, it's Latin for pear-shaped, which is how I help people remember the name of the muscle, piriformis, the form of a pear, it's Latin. Uh, piriformis is a chronic culprit in people. I find it overly shortened. Mm because people aren't doing a figure four stretch. They're not pulling their knee over across their body. Um, it's a common thing. When somebody asked me recently, what would you do for someone with low back pain? I'm like, knee to opposite shoulder. When I say knee to opposite shoulder, I might as well just say you're stretching and lengthening piriformis. Mm -hmm. It's chronically tight on people. When they have a tight set of gluteals, which includes that muscle, uh, their deep lateral rotators, they're having tight hips and it's affecting how they're using their lumbar spine. Mm. So when you say knee to opposite shoulder, that'd be like laying on your back and then bring one knee in, but rather than just bringing it straight, mm -hmm. you kind of yep. pull, like kind of pull it diagonally. You bring your body. right knee up over towards your left shoulder. You bring your left knee up over towards your right shoulder on the opposite side. And then what about um, like lunging positions? There's lots of, you know, kind of like lunge style positions in yoga. Even the warrior poses are like almost mm -hmm. a, a lunge shape that you're making. Um, it seems like that would be a great way for like stretching those muscles inside the glute. Is that true? You're working all across the hips. Um, when you say lunge, that general position is used in lots of different ways. If you're using standing poses like Virabhadrasana 1 or 2, that's a very different position than a low uh, lunge um, that are done in you know various ways. You're lengthening in a lunge. You're kind of lengthening so is on one side, and then you're also strengthening and using your quadriceps and then your hamstring on the opposite side, mm -hmm. but you're also just mobilizing deeply down through the hips, kind of related to that squat we were talking about. Right. You know, one of the things that I, I, I did want to mention when we were kind of talking about, um, you know, the, the, the squatting position and stuff, um, I think one of the key things, at least for me with low back pain, is that if I bend over at the hips, wrong as if to pick up something heavy or bend over to, you know, whatever, pick up groceries, get something out of the refrigerator. 
um, I am much more likely to feel that pinch, that pain in my low back. Whereas if I uh, just squat down to get something off the floor or lift something up, I'm like zero pain. Um, so I've started to be just really conscious of how I bend over, how I fold over. Um, and when I do have to get really low for something like looking at the bottom of the fridge, um, or adjusting camera angles that are on the floor, um, which I'm doing constantly throughout the day. Um, I've tried to really make it a habit to fall into that little molasses squat position, um, rather than folding over at the waist. Um, or if I am gonna fold over at the waist, try to like bend into my knees, kind of like a chair pose, you could say. Um, and it just, it, it saves my back in so many ways. So from that perspective, you know, the concept of somebody standing there folding over with their body, um, is there anything that you can speak to or maybe tips that you would give people about? Like Generally, I tell people not to lift with their back, which means what you were describing. You're, you're getting them to try to lift with their legs by keeping their spine mostly at neutral. Mm. You know, there's always different um, situations for this. A lot of it is still just movement. A lot of women that I've seen who have low back pain can sometimes have problems with their SI joints, especially if, they had, if they've had nat natural childbirth. Mm -hmm. What I often recommend to them is they go find a weight trainer and start doing deadlifts. They start doing things to strengthen and stabilize their core mm. because that's overly loose because they gave natural childbirth. It shifted the position of their pelvis and their hips. It's something good that they can do for themselves. For most people, I don't want to get into a point where I'm you know, pathologizing certain forms of movement. It's really about repetition and regularity. If you never move you lose mobility. And when you lose mobility, nine times out of 10, when I see people who are in pain, it's because they've got shortened, tight muscles or very weak kind of muscles that aren't engaging and they're not using them the way they should. Um, I've lifted with my back before. Ouch. Uh, I know what comes from it. Those are those little small muscles I was talking about along the spine. Those aren't designed to lift that way. Um, we get into this discussion of almost like evolutionary issues because humans are in an odd position that created my industry. We walk upright, totally weird. Um, it's not bodies were not designed evolutionarily. We, you know, we're all on all fours at one point. That's a very different physical position. We're putting strain on the lumbar spine, holding up the entire, you know, rest of our body. Mm -hmm. And I've heard that, you know, recommendation, lift with your legs, not with your back. Um, and for most of my life, that just meant nothing to me. I had no idea what that meant. Um, until I started noticing that like, oh, well, if I squat down and then lift something up, <laughs> lifting with my legs, not with my back. Um, but even when you do have to fold over to pick something up, like a couch or whatever, um, there's still this element where you can just... Uh, be aware of your spine and trying to keep your spine neutral um, and engaging the legs, eng engaging the glutes. And a lot of times that, at least for me, comes from like having somewhat of a bend in the knees and then just really being aware that like I'm going to make this movement come from my lower body. Because um, as you've pointed out, you know, several times, those are our big, you know, power muscles the legs, the glutes, and these really big muscle groups mm -hmm. compared to like these little tiny muscles along yeah. the spine, you can kind of imagine where, oh yeah, okay, lift with the legs, it's going to be much safer for your low back and really whole back um, than trying to use those little tiny Yep. Muscles. And you want to have movement. I mean, you want to use muscles, but it just makes you know sense. You, you wouldn't um, curl as much as you would squat. Mm -hmm. in weight. Right. You're using a larger muscle group that can deal with more strain. My legs and my gluteals propel me around all day long mm -hmm. and I'm, you know, 200 plus pounds. Right. It's like, if I try to walk on my hands, how does it feel? Ow. <laughs> so like, why? Cause they're, they're just smaller muscles. Okay. Yeah. Smaller muscle groups. Right. Very interesting. Um, so we talked a lot about, um, we talked about psoas, piriformis, 
Um, are there any other, you know, common culprits? We talked about the QL briefly, which is in the back, um, the hip hiker. I'm trying to think of, you know, other muscles specifically that cause people specific issues. I think the quadriceps are generally not addressed very much, but that's more of a foundational issue. Mm -hmm. In other words, below the sacrum. I'm trying to think of other muscles in, in particular, kind of like rectus abdominis, same thing. We discussed so is the gluteal muscles are much more complex than just gluteus maximus and piriformis. That's just the first, you know, few. Mm -hmm. um, the piece goods only go on quilts is a common thing for the deep lateral rotators, those muscles. A lot of that stuff just doesn't get any movement. People aren't doing squats. Right. They're not doing yoga. I mean, more people are than, you know, ever, but at the same time, for the mass number of people in the United States, when you sit in a chair, those muscles are essentially dead. They're not doing anything. <laughs> so being able to access those in some sort of movement is good. I'm trying to think if there's anything else specifically that I see that people are doing with their lumbar spine. So much of it has to do with position of the vertebra themselves, which is where I ask people if they're having, you know, they like to forward bend, generally bringing their knees towards their chest. If they tell me that that makes their back feel better, um, I'm assuming that I'm going to show them yoga poses to be able to facilitate that process so that they can lengthen and move that on their own. Mm -hmm. Um, lots of yoga people themselves, if they do yoga, I'll ask them, do you like forward bending or do you like backward bending? A common, with, uh, a common one with regular yoga practitioners, and I'll ask them what's their favorite pose and what's their least favorite pose. Mm. Their favorite pose is going to tell me where they're, they're strong and flexible. Their least favorite pose is going to tell me where the problem is. Mm. When they say, I hate camel, and I'm like, oh, all your flexors in the front, you can't open your chest, it's, you know, yeah. You're like over pushing through your lumbar spine. And that's just from a verbal intake, so to speak. It's not even seeing the pose itself. Um, also, everyone's body is just slightly different. Um, I run into it even as a pro body worker. I occasionally get stumped where somebody's having pain and I can't figure out where it's coming from. So is was one of those. I had a young lady come in and I did all my usual low back stuff. A lot of the stuff you'll see on the Psyche Truth channel didn't work. And, and I said, it's her psoas. And immediately, without using cream, I think we did one Psyche Truth video where I did some abdominal, abdominal work on Melissa Lemunian. But um, I went down slowly, down along her spine, through her abdomen to apply a little bit of pressure to what feels like her psoas. Mm -hmm. And once I hit pay dirt, so to speak, I went, oh, right there. And then she went, oh. <laughs> and I was like, does that feel like that broad pain, you know, you feel out across your sacrum at your low back? Oh, yes. And I worked on both sides. When you mentioned sitting, she had a Vipassana retreat to go to. She was doing 13 days in silent meditation sitting. She had no problems the entire retreat after that one session. Wow. But it's because something was going on with that specific muscle and the nerves related to it. I was using skin stretch to be able to access that area to kind of get her nervous system to calm down and stop maintaining tension in an area that wasn't necessary. Um, if there are other muscles, I think gluteus medius. Uh, gluteus medius is a little bit more to the side. I was kind of having a challenge over where to go. Mm -hmm. Gluteus medius, um, I'll have people use a tennis ball. It's more on the side. Mm -hmm. I think that people aren't getting it addressed as much because it's a little bit more to the side of the body as opposed to posterior and the gluteals where piriformis is. Mm -hmm. Like if I was reaching up over, remember I talked about the greater, greater trochanter at the side and then your iliac crest if you're hugging over at your hip uh, just above your low back mm -hmm. it's like if I sink down on my side and press basically on what feels like my tuchus and my hip right there that's gluteus medius a lot of people have chronically shortened gluteus medius that I think is affecting like their hip balance mm. very interesting so in addition to move your body do some yoga mm -hmm. um, because it sounds like there's so many yoga poses that are just really ideal for helping to open up the low back, address 
uh, some of those hard to reach muscles, it, you know, under the glutes, um, piriformis, psoas, etc. Um, I think that, you know, when it comes to, you know, this kind of obsession with glutes that's kind of happening right now and people are like, they want to get a bigger butt or do all of this or whatever, you know, one of the things that I think is important to recognize is that, you know, as we're spending lots of time sitting, you know, our glutes are just kind of sitting there hitting the snooze button. You know, when we're walking and moving and engaging muscles, it's very different than when we're being sedentary. Uh, so this concept of like a glute activation and exercises that activate your glutes and get those muscles to start firing um, can also be really beneficial because now you're getting those uh, big, strong, powerful muscles to start firing and start working to help you walk or hold you up or whatever, um, to take some of the pressure off those smaller muscles, um, QL or piriformis or psoas or whatever that um, just get really, really weak from all the sitting and, and not being engaged, not being used. Mm -hmm. The line between a tight muscle and a weak muscle is one that is really an edge for me because I don't know how to quote unquote muscle test to get an idea of what's weak, what's strong, you know, the line between um, working on tissue and affecting nerves to be able to help people. And I have great success rate with chronic pain, but I'm not a personal trainer. I don't have a, a degree in exercise physiology to say, oh, they're having some sort of imbalance. I'm not a uh, physical therapist where I can give like prescriptive exercise to help them work on stuff. I kind of somewhat do it in yoga class, but it's more like happenstance, walking them through poses and realizing they're having problems and then going, oh yeah, they, maybe their quads are weak or, you know, whatever. Right. I love what you were saying about, uh, you know, asking people, what's your favorite yoga pose? What's your least favorite yoga pose? Uh, are there some, maybe some other examples you could give of like, oh, if you really struggle in this yoga pose, that would be a sign that you should probably, you know, whatever. So Re let me let me think real that. quick of what yoga poses I get from people. No, notoriously, people hate camel. Uh, they hate the back bend that comes along with camel pose. Um, so camel is, you know, a pretty... Uh, I mean, full expression of camel, I would say, isn't super gentle. Mm -hmm. But basically, you're on your knees, and then you just start folding back. Mm -hmm. Putting your hands so on your heels. It's just that, like, kind of starting to back bend, starting to take the back out of the typical forward posture that most of us are in. Um, yeah, suddenly you become really aware that you have weakness of the spine to start bending back. Um, and then the front of the body, the chest, the pec muscles, if those are really tight, mm -hmm. then you're also gonna have a hard time with that pose. I find a lot of people, they have uh, challenges with upward bow, they have challenges with cobra, they have challenges with locust. And it's because the extensors are weak and the flexors are tight, which is to say the muscles in the front of their body are winning and they're slouching. The muscles in the back that help them extend in Cobra and Upward Bow, Superman, sometimes your yoga teacher will call it that, those muscles are weak. Interesting. So, you know, this, uh, this actually came up in a previous podcast with a yoga instructor, but she was just pointing out um, that, like, the difference between, uh, you know, I, I think the context was... Um, Olympic gold medalists versus the people who just place and go to the Olympics is how much time do they spend practicing the things they're bad at? And it just kind of like, uh, you know, it was really interesting on a, as a comment on, like, we tend to gravitate towards the things that feel really good to us, mm -hmm. that we feel really good at, um, and just kind of putting out there the idea that, like, Yes, that's awesome. Do those things that feel good, but also be willing to practice those stretches or postures that feel a little uncomfortable or Edges. confrontational. <laughs> what I will tend um, to do in a yoga class is if I know what's going on with that student, I'm going to give them enough of the stuff they like 
so that they're yay mm -hmm. and just enough of the stuff they don't so that it's still challenging. Mm -hmm. That way they're engaged. If I find somebody and they say, I hate camel pose, I mean, just hatred, loathing. What I do is I put them in a passive form of camel pose, which means they're not working in camel pose, they're letting go. And that's props. That's where Yengar Yoga had such a proud, profound influence on me. That's a lot of also what I'm showing massage therapists to have them deal with prolonged uh, tension in different areas is by propping someone, I can take the pieces out they, that they don't like. Mm -hmm. And I can give them a length and some stretch into an area that's a little bit harder for them to access. And they go, Oh, you can see a light bulb go off mm -hmm. when they realize, wow, this area of my body is chronically shortened. And then when they come out back to neutral, their sense of their body and physical space is profoundly different. Wow. Yeah. And I, uh, I know that we included a lot of those um, kind of assisted stretches in the yoga massage program where you were actually kind of. Um, I know that I modeled for some of those, Lucy modeled for some of those, but I remember you specifically, you know, using a foam roller or a bolster, kind of moving her into a position, being like, hey, doesn't that look a lot like, you know, camel pose or mm -hmm. whatever? Uh, and you can kind of really get that, um, you know, kind of visual confirmation, so to speak, that you can see the body um, in the stretch, in the similar position, um, but in a way that allows the person to be completely relaxed. Mm -hmm. So in camel, you're standing up on your knees and bending backwards. This is like potentially going to be hard on your knees. Potentially you start feeling nervous bending backwards from that position. Whereas taking, um, you know, a stretch where you just lay down and then use a foam roller or pillow underneath the upper back to create some of that back bending, uh, you know, shape without actually the person having to be, you know, balancing and moving and whatever. Um, you can really see how, wow, you're going to be able to create openness and space in the spine. You're starting to introduce this new posture, or this new movement to the body, but in a very safe, mm -hmm. um, safe place where there's no fear. Um, that you're going to fall out of it or anything like that. Just kind of taking all of those uh, potential fearsome components and just bringing them out of the equation, letting people get that stretch in a really relaxed way. Yeah. It's the, the practice itself, again, from time massage to yoga, I just broke all of the boundaries and barriers down. Um, I look at them essentially as part of the same practice when it comes to mobility. So being able to give them a passive way where I work on them and then an active way where I figured out what muscles are tight and I'm going to show them how to prop themselves and work on themselves. That combination of active and passive always seemed to be better than one or the other, than either or. So I just tended to combine the two. And when it comes to lack of range of motion and lack of mobility, the transformation I have seen in people, it's almost like they feel like they have a new body. Mm -hmm. They just, you know, if I take them and put them in a prolonged back bend and teach them breathing exercises, I put them over a foam roll, had them work through it for 20, 30 minutes. When they stand up, they're, I, they're like, I, I feel taller. Mm -hmm. And it's like, you are. The muscles in the front of your chest have been pulling that stuff in a way that the muscles in the back are not strong enough to fight. Mm -hmm. I had to put them in that back bend long enough to lengthen that tissue to get their nervous system to go, oh, okay, yeah, we have been holding tension there. Mm -hmm. They've gotten to a point where, you know, to give you an example, if I go to the supermarket and I find an old guy and he's all hunched over his cart, I know you've seen this before, he's hunched over his cart and he's got his head lifted to look up and out, that is not a function of biology. That is a function of nurture. That is a function of culture. You can unwind that. And you can unwind that because people, he didn't, he didn't just wake up that way one day. Right. He evolved 
to that point over the course of his lifetime. And that's what I'm trying to prevent. Mm -hmm. You're trying to prevent those flexors in the front from becoming overly shortened and tight and trying to open the chest, specifically with that posture in particular. Robert, I just want to thank you so much for taking this time with us today, and um, I really look forward to having you on the program again. It's always so enlightening to learn from you, and I'm just really appreciative of you being here. Thank you so much. It's always a pleasure. I want to thank all of you for listening to the Wellness Plus podcast. Remember, you can find video versions of this podcast over on wellnessplus.tv. And if you'd like to learn more about Robert, you can visit him at robertgardnerwellness.com. I want to thank you all so much for listening, and we can't wait to have you for another Wellness Plus podcast.